Hey guys, Ken Smith, Ken Smith Fishing. Uh, finally got together with Todd Driscoll this week, Texas Park and Wildlife Biologist. I've got, I think, over two hours of material and thinking back over it, I've not started editing yet. This is going to be the first piece. I think every bit of it is stuff you guys are going to be interested in because every bit of it was stuff I was interested in. You guys had submitted a list of questions. Any of, so I, I forwarded those to Todd before we met, actually about three or four weeks ago. And I got to say first, thank you to Todd because he didn't just sit down and shoot off the cuff. He took all of our questions. He did the research you're going to hear. He's got some fascinating statistics for us. Uh, this, is, this is a great interview. I'm going to post it on YouTube and on Facebook. And I'm going to post it on Facebook to make it easier to share. I'm going to post all these videos on Facebook. This is not just stuff about Texas fishing. This is stuff about fishing across the country. As I've mentioned to you guys, I'm really trying to grow my viewer base outside of just Texas. So if you've got bass fishing friends uh, in Texas or outside of Texas that you think might be interested in this information, please share these videos with them. I really appreciate that. Uh, I mentioned in my video yesterday or the day before, uh, I'm going to cross a million lifetime views uh, this week. And I'm, I'm just flabbergasted by how much you guys, uh, the feedback you guys have given me and the fact that y'all are interested in watching, which tells me, hopefully, I'm getting, got a truck going by, which tells me, hopefully, I'm getting the kind of video content out there you guys enjoy. So, uh, this is great stuff. Uh, thank you again for Todd for sitting down with me. And uh, so I'm going to put these in about 15-minute increments, and I'll also tell you, there's not a lot of reason to sit and view these. I personally think these are great drive time videos. Just start it on your phone and you can listen to it in the truck, doing, going to work or going to meetings or doing whatever you do throughout the day. So I think this is going to be stuff you really learn. I, I certainly did. Uh, things about our fisheries and about largemouth bass and just about what's going on in the state of Texas and just all kinds of interesting information. So I'll hush now and get right to the video and again there'll be I got to think there'll be at least eight of these uh, over the course of the next several weeks. Uh, I'll get them up for you guys. So here we go. Todd Driscoll, Texas Park and Wildlife. Hey guys, Ken Smith, KenSmithFishing.com. Yeah, I still say that. I'm sitting here with Todd Driscoll. Uh, I've talked about this. We've got a lot of questions that right. we've been asked. Yeah. Be uh, and we're going to go through. Todd's going to answer as many of them as we can today. We're going to break <coughs> this in a couple of different parts because there's really kind of three big topics we want to talk about. But before we go there, tell us who you are, a little bit about your background, how you wound up in Texas Park and Wildlife. Tom Driscoll, I've been a district biologist here with Parks and Wildlife for a heck of time gets away from me, over 20 years now. Really? I'm just so blessed. I've been here at Sam Rayburn Toledo Bend area for all but seven or eight months of my career. I got lucky to get down here real, real early, and uh, I tell you what, I just, just love the area. I got into being a fisheries biologist just for my love of the outdoors and, and, and love of fishing. Where'd you grow up? Grew up in uh, western Kansas, fall places, Dodge City. No kidding. Yeah. Not a lot of bass fishing around there. No, you? there wasn't a lot of bass fishing, but, uh, you know, hunting opportunities. It's really kind of like this area here in terms of fishing, bass fishing opportunities. Kansas was that way with hunting. And really anything you wanted to do. I mean, the diversity was just unbelievable, but, you know, I remember... I've always been super competitive, played every sport known to man. And I remember being 8, 9, 10, 12 years old and watching the old Bassmasters TV shows, Bob Cobb days. Absolutely. And just, you know, I always loved to fish. And, and we had some, oh, some decent walleye fisheries, but they were primarily just wind-swept, muddy, featureless reservoirs up there in Kansas that had a lot of white bass. That's, that's what my fishing was. But I just remember thinking, man, one day, you know, if I could just get somewhere where there's good bass fishing and be able to fish a bass tournament, wouldn't that be cool? You know, and then luckily, six months, six, six eight months into my parks and wildlife career, this job opens up. Just been a dream come true. Where did you Where did you go to school? I went to uh, Kansas State University and got my BS degree in uh, fisheries biology, and then I got a master's degree at Mississippi State University. Okay, and then moved to Texas. What year? 1998. Okay. I started with a department up in uh, Wichita Falls area. And now what is your responsibility? I lose track of how many counties I have, but uh, it's a pretty wide area. I mean, there's 15 folks like me throughout the whole state of Texas. Okay. 
that have a, a management area, so many counties and so many lakes, of course. I've got uh, Sam Rayburn, Toledo Bend, Lake Livingston, uh, Lake Nacogdoches, Kurth Lake, Lake Nacogdoches, Pinkston, Timpson. I think those are the, the highlights. Okay. But a lot of water for sure. Yeah. So what do you, are you, do you go to those bodies of water pretty regularly or how does that work? Sure we do. The, uh, yeah. our, our sampling, and it's both, uh, you know, fish population sampling as well as uh, the, the end product, the, the, the fishing, the, 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 the angler success type sampling, krill survey is what we call it. Uh, we're on a general rotation. You know, some of our, let's say, lower priority lakes are sampled at least once every four years, but our high profile fisheries were there pretty regularly. So talk about that for a second, because I've been, I've had those guys come up to me before. Yeah. And just like everybody else, I'm a tournament bass fisherman, and it's like, well, yes, I'm catching them, or no, I'm not. Talk, talk to the guys about how important it is to tell those guys what's really going on. Yeah, you know, uh, I view it, those, those are what we call creel surveys, interviewing anglers. I mean, sometimes we do it on smaller lakes, we do it at the boat ramp. But these large lakes, Sam Rayburn, Toledo Bend, there's so many ramps, and uh, it's just much, much more efficient to do it out on the water. Those are called roving creel surveys. You know, that survey, I mean, that's measuring the end product, right, of what we provide. We can take the shocking boat out there and sample the bass populations, but the end product is angler catch. Right. So it's very important that, that we measure that. It's also good for us to, to get out there and interact with the public. You know, we can ask additional questions, uh, opinion type questions, questions maybe to a, to a regulation change we may be thinking about. So, you know, in, in my view, the most important survey that, that we do. How often do we do them here at Raven or Toledo? For years, we did them every year, nonstop. But the uh, the data that we got from those surveys was so good and so consistent that we realized that we could maybe put effort in some other places and, and back off on those surveys. We've kind of went from that every year for 30 plus years to every other year. Now, we do those angler krill surveys just once every four years okay. on both Rayburn and Toledo Bend. All right, so three big topics we wanted to talk, talk about. Fish care, your release studies, and the state of our fisheries. So since sure. we're already on that, let's talk a little bit about the state of our fisheries yeah. down here. Okay. So our questions were, all right, so first question, um, <coughs> and, I, and I know you've reviewed these questions. There were a lot of questions about the sores we're seeing on fish, and, and generally I think that's post-spawn. So talk a little bit about what you see and what that is and what we can do to make that better or what we do to make that worse. The, uh, the, the open sores that we, that we see, and it's typically post-spawn through the midsummer, is uh, generally called a red sore disease for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, typically it's just a circular open sore, sometimes the size of a dime, sometimes it can be as large as a quarter or bigger. Yeah. And fish can have multiple spots like that. That's, that's a, 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 what we would call a secondary infection we all know the uh, spawning process is very stressful on fish. Uh, their, their, their immune systems are lower because of on that. On the male and the female? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just a, a stressful time of the year. So uh, because the fish is in a weakened state, they're more susceptible to other types of infections, just like we are when our mm -hmm. immune systems get lower. That's kind of the dynamic there, plus the, uh, the, the critters that cause that is typically either uh, bacterial in nature or protozoal. And even the healthiest of waters, I mean, bacteria is just naturally found in it. So fish, gets, uh, fish is in a weakened state. The spawning process is physical. There, there's a lot of uh, touching there where mucus is removed. And uh, a good many fish end up getting those infections. Now, very, very rarely is it lethal. I mean, probably 99.9% .9 of the time it's just unsightly, mm -hmm. but the fish recovers from it just fine. Is there anything in handling the fish you can do to help or hurt that fish? Just a good rule of thumb with just general fish handling is, is, is avoid any kind of mucus removal, obviously, the slime coat. When I mean, you remove any of that slime coat, even during other parts of the year, it's almost always going to get infected. That's how you know, important that mucus layer is. It's the fish's first line of defense against any of these uh, pathogens. All right, so you know one of the questions that came in, and it fascinates me. So Stacy Spriggs caught a Cheryl Lone Star Lunker two years ago. And when the guys came down to look at that fish, which I believe they released that fish, they decided not to take that fish back to, to, to do anything with it. But she said every time he handled it, he put surgical gloves on. Is that specifically for the slime? 
Yes, it is. It's just a, a, a precautionary measure. Uh, wet, making sure your hands are wet is probably just as good, but let's face it, I mean, our share lunker folks are going to go to the utmost sure. extreme on caring for these fish. So that, that's exactly what it's for, is to prevent any mucus removal. So I'm just curious, would, <clears throat> is it possible I would help my fish? I handle them the most, put them from the live well into my way back, right? Would it be a good idea for me to carry some latex gloves in the boat and just slip a pair on for that five minutes of doing that? Or certainly wouldn't hurt anything. Okay. Is it absolutely necessary? You know, we might be, you know, getting into the weeds, so to speak. But no, it wouldn't hurt a thing at all. And, and I'm I'm guilty of this, so I'm going to bring it up. I've I've dropped a few on the carpet before, so that's got to be really bad for them then as well. Oh yeah, you know, carpet burns, what we call them, and we've all unintentionally done it. True. But yeah, that's uh that's not. Not good. I mean, so, that's going to remove mucus. So am I not practicing? I stick a four pounder. What's my best way to put that fish in the boat, get it unhooked? Just get it up and lip it or net it, or what's the best way to do that? Well, you know, as, as fans of the sport, I'm sure most of us have been watching the, the major league fishing format, you know, the, the penalties they get. You know, the way that they, uh, because of the penalties, the way they land fish, I mean, it, just avoiding the carpet. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, the bottom line. But also, through the mouth, it's got to be better than under the belly, I would think. Yeah, I mean, uh, holding the fish by the lower jaw, as long as you keep it straight, uh, vertical. Not this way, this yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. You know, jacking the jaw, as we like to call it, uh, you know, getting the fish more horizontal. I mean, that's that's real bad. That can dislocate and even break the jaw, especially on a fish over five pounds. I don't remember catching that size. So oh, yeah, really you, 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 you do too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the larger the fish, the, the worse that is. But straight up vertical, for short periods of time, no harm done. Okay. Um, so I ask you a question. So I'm, I'm a friend with Albert Collins, as are you. And Albert made a comment to me. <clears throat> Let me back up. So you know who Mike Metcalf is, obviously. Oh, yeah. So Mike and fishes with another friend of ours, Randy Qualls, <laughs> off and on. And they had gone, Randy had shared with me that they had gone back to some of Mike's old Toledo haunts where, you know, he dominated. I mean, I'm sure whatever house he lives in in Lufkin, I paid a pretty fair chunk of that house. But he said a lot of those fish, a lot of those spots he used to just wreck them on, he can't get fed on anymore. And Randy shared with me that my, their thoughts were that part of that's because the timber has fallen down. And I said something to Albert Collins about that. And Albert's comment was, hmm, and, and you may more, more want to come out, comment on this as a fisherman than as a fisheries biologist. But Albert's comment to me was he thinks that's because those fish said he's got spots up your toy. He said he could catch them ever cast and he can't get fit there anymore. He said he believes those were more native fish and that the Florida fish set up and feed differently than those original native fish. You, what do you think about that? You know, you're talking about Mike and Albert. Heck, they're good enough fishermen. I almost tell you they caught them all. I mean, maybe that's the reason, huh? But no, uh, I, I'm not aware of any studies that have actually examined in any kind of detail, you know, habitat preference differences between our native northern bass and Florida bass. But I just, there may be some differences there, really just hasn't been explored. So, uh, anybody's guess, really. I mean, it could be, uh, you know, maybe just the, the fish density in the lakes, fish per acre just aren't quite as high as they were years ago, just due to you know a little bit of declining lake productivity as, as reservoirs age. That could be part of it too. It, so, is that the case today? Are there less fish in? Let's use regular example today than there were 20 years ago. Are there studies that we know? If you uh, look at our long-term electrofishing uh, database, it's pretty rock solid. It's, it's declined some. No, the, the, our surveys actually show it's, it's very stable. Okay, so it hasn't changed much. Do you, Based on our electric fishing surveys, no. And you may not be able to comment on this, but does the hydrilla make the fishery more productive, uh, better for fish to grow in, or does it not? Oh, I would unquestionably say hydrilla at Sam Rayburn and Toledo Bend and various other lakes is 100% beneficial for numerous reasons. Now, you know, hydrilla officially is classified as a prohibited plant. I mean, it's labeled an invasive exotic, but if you look at it case by case by case, I mean, who's going to deny the, the benefits here at Sam Rayburn and Toledo Bend? In fact, 
complaints about it are where is it? We don't have enough of right, it. Right, yeah, we've got a bad deal. Contrast that to, to a situation like Lake Conroe, it's totally different. I mean, you have so many people that don't fish down there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just recruitment-wise, right? I mean, uh, bass recruitment. I say recruitment. Generally, that means that the, the survival of young fish till they reach, say, age one. Such a critical time for, for year class training. The more habitat we have, the end result is the more adult bass we're going to have to catch. And hydrologists adds to that habitat equation. It just increases the survival of young of the year bass and leads to more adult bass later on down the road. Secondly, and I know both of us can relate to this, I, I know, I mean, I love fishing any kind of hybrid. Doesn't matter if it's topped out in 15 feet of water or two feet tall and 10 feet of water. Fish just like it. They position on it. Catchability of bass increases when we have some hydrilla fish. Yeah. You remove that hydrilla, for a while the, the, the population's not going to change any. Or the adult population for a few years isn't going to change at all. But the fish are harder for us to find and catch. A lot of those fish. Well, fishing tomorrow. They're either on brush piles or they're out there suspended around timber out in the middle of the lake somewhere. You get a bunch of a bunch of hydrilla in the lake and hey, they're right there for us to, to more easily find and catch. And and most of our and I know you're your fisheries biologist, but most of our lack of hydrilla right now is high water, right? Oh absolutely. Yeah, you know, we uh we hear it all the time. It's just human nature when uh, hydrilla declines, whether it's Rayburn or Toledo, it doesn't matter. You know, some just instantly want to assume it's it's our agency spraying. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I don't know that we have ever treated any hydrilla at Toledo Bend. And at Sam Rayburn, I think there's been one acre of treatment historically, and that was at the Swim Beach of San Augustine Park. No kidding. Right. We we do not treat hydrilla. Right. What part of the agency does that? The uh, vegetation uh, treatment is actually guy stationed right here or right now at the East Texas Fish Hatchery. There's a separate crew here that handles all the uh, vegetation spray. Gotcha. And it's primarily uh, giant salvinia now, of course, with, with a secondary uh, water highs of treatment here and there. But the salvinia is much of their effort. Can it be stopped? Do you, I mean, I know it's not your... It can be controlled. Yeah. Can it be eradicated? No. We've got...